a mixed mode of a globalized present. Um, Fiamma Montezemolo, in discussion with Nestor Garcia Conclini, has described working conditions in Tijuana's maquiladoras as, quote, without unions, without rights, fixed in a historical moment that we thought was already over. I would differentiate the dynamics of the finished product, meaning um, the, the, the product itself, from that of production. These two conditions would seem to belong to two different periods, which paradoxically continue to exist contemporaneously in Tijuana. Um, end quote. So when we use the terms post-industrial or post-work, she asserts, we must always ask where and for whom this post operates. As she suggests, global south cities like Tijuana stage precisely the coexistence of different forms, troubling the neat divide between modernism and postmodernism. In Sleep Dealer, labor is both mind-numbing Fordist factory and postmodernist flexible virtuality. It's superimposition exposing the asymmetries of a supposedly homogenizing global capitalism. The film renders visible these uneven textures, as opposed to the cel celebratory formulation of multiple or, or alternative modernities, by juxtaposing them within a grounded site. And so I, what I'm trying to get is I think it's important that it's still insisting upon Tijuana as the location um, for, for, for this vision of the future. So as Luce and Memo walk around the city, um, the sealed off border is depicted as a scar, as a ruin and as a remainder of processes of exclusion gestured at in their references to the time before the wall. After all, in an entirely virtual world, um, there would be no need for um, Memo to migrate from Oaxaca to Tijuana. Um, there would be no need to be physically closer to the US. Um, and in this sense, the scar of the border and the backdrop of their lives in Tijuana embodies this uneven texture, alluding also to a history of violence that persists in the film's dystopic vision of the future. This image of the scar is also embodied in the nodes, which I mentioned are these um, metal circuits that the workers have um, put in, installed into their bodies in order to connect into the global economy. Polymorphic, the nodes function as interfaces between legal and illegal economies, between the local and the global, and between labor and sexuality. On one hand, the nodes are both symptom and vehicle of an exploitive and formal economy. So with them, workers are able to labor on and with images through virtual reality technology that immerses them into an alternate world, not for pleasure, but for survival. There is sort of like they're working on video games, um, but it's obviously this sort of very debilitating labor that's endless and, and consumes both their vision and their, and their bodies. In addition, the nodes and their requisite orifices, which the camera lingers on with close-ups, imply the feminization of the labor force that Donna Haraway explores in her cyborg manifesto. Workers are penetrated by wires that leave them exposed to the perils of a globalized economy in the form of electrical surges. So here's an image of, there's a lot of images in the film showing the workers connecting with their nodes as well as having the nodes installed, which is a, it's a painful process. Um, and they have to be com continually re-shot up with more, um, they call it um, techie like the Yoda bars and get shot up with more of this stuff to continue to be able to work. Um, on the other hand, and also with a nod to Donna Haraway's notion of computerized technology's two-faced quality, in Sleep Dealer, the nodes make possible a continual play on the verb conectar, repeated throughout the film. Along with Memo, we first see the nodes live on the bus to Tijuana where he meets Luz, who is an object of desire, and her bare arms are punctuated with them. Film dialogue hints at the fact that the nodes had a prehistory prior to their incorporation into the global economy of a counterculture linked to sexual experimentation and gaming. In this sense, the characters are not only exploited workers, they are also users who employ these invisible circuits as palpable bodily presences, endowed with libido and affect. These scenes also provide the spectator with moments of arrest in terms of visual pleasure that suggest possibilities or, alterna or, or alternative uses even within the instruments of exploitation. Recently, Catherine Hales, who's a, a theorist that I'm working with a lot lately, or I've been reading a lot of her lately, um, has argued that Haraway's seminal concept of the cyborg, which was written in the 80s, her cyborg manifesto, needs to be rethought beyond the individual unit. So the cyborg, she says, is too individual of a unit. Um, and she writes that it's quite, this is quote, um, quite simply not networked enough, end quote. 
What's interesting about Rivera's border cyborgs, however, is that they are always already networked, hooked up into the cognosphere, that's the term that Hales uses, um, that is global capitalism. Their nodes allow modes of connection previously impossible, but they also interrupt other circuits, namely that of the family and a sense of autochtony or belonging to a place. The slogan, anyone can connect, which is sort of repeated throughout the film, alludes to the promise of an infinitely mobile cyberspace without boundaries or borders, a space without materiality or territory, and yet the dream of a deterritorialized virtual space is undercut from the very beginning with its imbrications in an increasingly unequal system of labor distribution. Does cyberspace offer, as media theorist Jesus Martin Barbero has recently argued, an alternative to Latin America's long history of privileging writing as a technology implicated in a vastly uneven distribution of power? Or does it merely provide the illusion of a deterritorialized space, a trap for would-be hackers, anti-capitalists, and cyborgs? From the vantage point of the 21st century, when cyberspace is clearly not the uncharted frontier it was for 80s science fiction, how can we define the potentials and limitations of this now consolidated medium for the global south? Directing these questions to its spectators, Sleep Dealer stages the Janus face relationship between labor and technology under global capitalism, its dual potential for a politics of liberation and false promises of mobility. In the scene where Luce injects Memo with his nodes, blood and scar tissue are framed by close-ups and a violent initiation into this circuit that transforms him into a cyborg. This scarring returns us to the border trope, for here the human body, which in the early cyber literature and film was um, referred to as sort of derogatorily as the meat, and it was supposed to be dispensed with in order to enter this bodiless network. Um, this human body is itself marked and scarred by its entry into the virtual bodiless space of global capitalism, or supposedly virtual bodiless space. In this sense, it's interesting that both Sleep Tear and La Antenna linger on the motif of the scar to allude to lingering patterns that cannot be overlooked in science fiction's appeal to an imagined futurity. And here I'll conclude. Um, for Frederick Jameson, as well as for the Argentine sci-fi critic Ezequiel de Rosso, science fiction is less a commentary on the future than an interrogation of how the present functions as the past for an as yet unimaginable future. Science fiction, that is, is a genre of alternative grammars, of possibilities housed both in the past and the future. I have suggested that this operation occurs through the trope of the scar and its insistence on historical memory as a thickness or density on the surface of the globalized network or the screen itself. In Sleep Dealer, it functions as an allusion to a long history of worker exploitation in U.S. Mexican history, already apparent in Rivera's short film, which is sort of the seed for this longer film called Why Cybraceros? from 1997. Um, and this film is a satire that imagines um, that it's exactly the same premise as, as the longer film. Um, but it does an interesting thing where it mixes um, footage from the California Growers Council promotional sort of propaganda footage called uh, Why, Why Braceros, from a 1959 film, which is a promotional film for Why Would We Want Bracero Labor. Um, and it mixes it with this image of Why Sai Braceros. So we could have Mexican labor without the Mexicans, basically, which is the premise of the film. Um, and in, in La Antena, it's the relationship between dictatorship and neoliberal market that is underscored, while in Sleep Dealer, um, there's a kind of remediation or repurposing of the technologies of mid-20th century, um, in this case, uh, hands picking fruit and celluloid cinema, um, which do not disappear but are reactivated in light of computerized technology. Rather than being rendered obsolete, manual labor has been repurposed in the language of, of media theory. Um, in order to reproduce older patterns. This is a persistent feature, I would suggest, of the slender corpus of Latin American science fiction, in which historical patterns of injustice are rehearsed and critiqued in the context of an imagined future that asks us to consider how it might have been otherwise. Thank you. So I'll be happy to take any questions. Sure. Is uh, La Antenna, do you know if it's available on DVD? It is available on DVD. You might not be able to find it <laughs> so easily. Um, I mean, you can find it easily in Argentina, um, but I don't, it's, oh. not available in, it's not available on Netflix, but it is, it is out on DVD. Oh, no. Yeah, and you might even be able to find it on, I haven't checked to see if you could find it on, on YouTube. It really is quite a striking film. 
visually just to, to see. Yeah, especially if you're interested in sort of relationship between early cinema and contemporary cinema. And I had never seen a film like it um, when I saw it. Um, and it's interesting, too, because um, some of you might be aware that there was a full uh, version of Metropolis down in the basement in a, in a canister in Buenos Aires recently. And this story that's this kind of amazing kind of Borgesian detective story where this guy just thought it was there and couldn't get to it and found it. Um, and it was really sort of a find for world cinema. And this happened right after, around the same time that La Antena was being made. So I like to think about this relationship between Metropolis and Argentine film production as also um, working on that level, too, um, and the sort of making the Argentine Metropolis in 2007, you know, instead of 1927. But, yeah. What kind of people would watch those films? The two films that I showed? Yeah, I mean, Sleep Dealer is a widely available film. It's available on Netflix. Um, it's not. It's available, not... yes, but I mean, wouldn't want to watch <laughs> well, I was, gonna, I was gonna ask how well it did. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's an independent film, so it's not gonna have the same box office appeal as a Hollywood film. But it was it's actually very popular, and um, he's been touring for years, showing the film. He does a lot of tours at festivals and and universities. Actually, he's our invited filmmaker for the conference that I'm organizing. Um, and I can well, if we have time, I could show you some images because our website is is based on some of the stills from the film. But um, I think the Lantana, Lantana had a smaller audience. Um, it, it screened basically at sort of art house um, cinemas in, in Argentina. And um, yeah. yeah, but they're, they're great films, so I recommend them. I have, I have to tell you, I mean, I haven't seen uh, uh -huh. Lantana, but I, I have seen Sleeping mm -hmm. before watching the whole thing because it's like, and I was going to ask you if you, you see some. Optimism, I mean, without mm -hmm. giving away. Yeah. Away yes. Movie, Definitely. Yeah, I, I, I think. I, I literally got it probably in two weeks or two or three weeks. Oh, he's, he's doing a Midwest tour, tour then because, because he's going to the University of Michigan and to Iowa and so, yeah. 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 So, yeah. You, you see some optimism? Yes. Yes, definitely. And I think that's part of it. It has to be like, it's definitely like a post nationalist kind of um, call for solidarity. So, if you think about, well, without giving, I don't want to plot spoil, but the three characters that come together at the end of the film represent three different, it's sort of a, three, three different national places, but it's sort of like a Spanish-speaking diaspora of sort of misfits. It's a very sort of cyberpunk. That's why I think it's sort of a cyberpunk mentality of the outcasts that find each other and create these, these alternatives. Um, and the, also the sort of the trope of the urban garden that emerges at the end um, is really interesting. Um, so yeah, no, I think I mean it's a it's a dystopia with a with a not entirely depressing right way of thinking about about the future. Is yeah. that also the case with the antenna? I mean, yes, yeah. it is. Yes, uh, uh, it is. Yeah, I think it's interesting. It's like there's these pretty much the dystopic register sustained throughout the entire film until the very end. Yeah. Yeah. You, um, this is really, thanks a lot. It was really interesting. Lot of There's yeah. something that you mentioned in passing that I, I mm -hmm. want to ask to expand on. I know the name of the camera mm -hmm. a little bit, and, which is very occupied with the spiral. Yes. And you mentioned the word verticalization, mm -hmm. which, you know, and I was just wondering, I guess, do you, it sounded like you were saying that the, the newer films are not as vertical as the old ones. So I was just wondering if you could expand on that. Yeah. So this is something that I've been thinking about a lot. I mean, um, because Metropolis has been so influential in sci-fi film in general, and it's so present in the Sapir's film, and so present in other major sci-fi films like Blade Runner, and those all have this sort of vertical mesenchyme. So, um, power is 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 rendered um, hierarchies are rendered through visual space, particularly through architecture. So the workers work underground, you know, in Metropolis, and then the higher up you go, this is the same in Blade Runner. The, the closer you get to power, and that's kind of true in La Antena, um but it's, you know, especially because the, the antenna itself is sort of perched in space. It's sort of this weird impossibility that the film kind of mines. Um, but I do think that most science fiction film, and definitely Sleep Dealer, is not interested in that. It's not interested in a vertical mesenchyme. It's interested in a horizontal grid um, that is much more proper to cyberspace than to the sort of modernist imaginary of, you know, one building where you could imagine different kinds of relations of power. And there was that shot of the, the like, tunnel shot. Right, yeah. Which reminded me of The Matrix. 
Yes. Uh, this is very, the film is very influenced by The Matrix, too, I think. And, but The Matrix has a vertical thing. Yeah, to, yeah. Yeah. But no, I like to think more about that, because um, I think this idea of a grid or a network that's not vertical is a really interesting way to think about transnational labor, right? So you can't, ha the labor's not in the same space, you know, in the same vertical space. It's, it's extended horizontally. It might and, be a cheap shot, but if you talked about the rhizome, no, I don't think it's a cheap shot. No, yeah, uh, I mean, I mean like, it's, it's got, I don't know. Yeah. It, it can be overused, right? Right. No, I think that that I think that would be worthwhile to think about for Sleep Jailer in particular. But. Yeah. Are right, ladies, so I don't know if this question is really. Uh -huh. <laughs> but I enjoyed what I heard. <laughs> and I was very curious about that water at the beginning yes. of the Mm -hmm. In terms of ecology, mm -hmm. what statements do they have? And, yeah. Um, so this is something that I would be interested in thinking about more because it, there's a lot of films that have been dealing with this question about water. I mean, there's this even, have you seen this film, Even the Rain? Um, and then even like the latest James Bond film was all about water. And <laughs> there's a beautiful short science fiction film from Kenya called Pumzi. I don't know if you've seen this film, John. Um, and they're all about um, the scarcity of water and um, what that means for life. And it's, they usually seem to involve someone, um, some sort of lone figure kind of finding or somehow re-channeling re, re the water in some way. Um, in Sleep Dealer, and the, without giving away the ending, um, I think that um, it tries to find a balance between this. It doesn't want to be a pastoral celebration, which I think is the, the risk sometimes in these kinds of narratives about um, you know, a back to the land sort of thing where um, but at the so that's why it, it imagines a sort of urban garden um, where um, there is a possibility for growth and life outside of this policed water. Um, but I think that this is going to be like I think we're going to continue to see films about about water and about ecology and I mean and, and sci-fi in particular. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if I answered your question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I guess if there aren't any questions, I'll, I'll hang around if anyone wants to ask me anything else. But thank you. For, yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm always looking for like foreign sci-fi movies. Do you have any other recommendations? Sure. Yeah, I'm teaching a class on this. So if you want to send me an email, I can.
In Sleep Dealer, labor is both mind-numbing Fortis factory and postmodernist flexible virtuality. It's superimposition exposing the asymmetries of a supposedly homogenizing global capitalism. The film renders visible these uneven textures as opposed to the cel celebratory formulation of multiple or, or alternative modernities by juxtaposing them within a grounded site. And so I, what I'm trying to get is I think it's important that it's still insisting upon Tijuana as the location um, for, for, for this vision of the future. So as Luz and Memo walk around the city, um, the sealed off border is depicted as a scar, as a ruin, and as a remainder of processes of exclusion gestured at in their references to the time before the wall. After all, in an entirely virtual world, um, there would be no need for um, Memo to migrate from Oaxaca to Tijuana, with like this sort of very debilitating labor that's endless and, and consumes both their vision and their, and their bodies. In addition, the nodes in their requisite orifices, which the camera lingers on with close-ups, imply the feminization of the labor force that Donna Haraway explores in her cyborg manifesto. Workers are penetrated by wires that leave them exposed to the perils of a globalized economy in the form of electrical surges. So here's an image of, there's a lot of images in the film showing the workers connecting with their nodes as well as having the nodes installed, which is a, it's a painful process. Um, and they have to be com continually re-shot sh up with more, um, they call it um, techy, like the Yoda bars, and get shot up with more of this stuff to continue to be able to work. Um, on the other hand, Anna, um, there would be no need to be physically closer to the U.S. Um, and in this sense, the scar of the border and the backdrop of their lives in Tijuana embodies this uneven texture, alluding also to a history of violence that persists in the film's dystopic vision of the future. This image of the scar is also embodied in the nodes, which I mentioned are these um, metal circuits that the workers have um, put in, installed into their bodies in order to connect into the global economy. Polymorphic, the nodes function as interfaces between legal and illegal economies, between the local and the global, and between labor and sexuality. On one hand, the nodes are both symptom and vehicle of an exploitive and formal economy. So, with them, workers are able to labor on and with images through virtual reality technology that immerses them into an alternate world, not for pleasure, but for survival. There is sort of like they're working on video games, um, but it's obvious. And also with a nod to Donna Haraway's notion of computerized technology's two-face quality. In Sleep Dealer, the nodes make possible a continual play on the verb conectar, repeated throughout the film. Along with Memo, we first see the nodes live on the bus of Tijuana where he meets Luz, who is an object of desire, and her bare arms are punctuated with them. Film dialogue hints at the fact that the nodes had a prehistory prior to their incorporation into the global economy of a counterculture linked to sexual experimentation and gaming. In this sense, the characters are not only exploited workers, they are also users who employ these invisible circuits as palpable bodily presences, endowed with libido and affect. These scenes also provide the spectator with moments of arrest in terms of visual pleasure that suggest possibilities or, alter or, or alternative uses even within the instruments of exploitation. Recently, Catherine had a mixed mode of a globalized present. Um, Fiamma Montezemolo, in discussion with Nestor Garcia Conclini, has described working conditions in Tijuana's maquiladoras as, quote, without unions, without rights, fixed in a historical moment that we thought was already over. I would differentiate the dynamics of the finished product, meaning um, the, the, the product itself, from that of production. These two conditions would seem to belong to two different periods, which paradoxically continue to exist contemporaneously in Tijuana. Okay. Um, end quote. So when we use the terms post-industrial or post-work, she asserts, we must always ask where and for whom this post operates. As she suggests, global south cities like Tijuana stage precisely the coexistence of different forms, troubling the neat divide between modernism and postmodernism. <laughs>